There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with part two of my book haul. And I don't usually do book hauls, but I've decided to do one because I got so many great books in Canada last week. So let's continue on, shall we? I also picked up a reading copy of Sinclair Ross's most famous novel, As For Me and My House. I read this, I think, at, in high school and then again in uh, university and uh, don't remember a whole lot about it. I keep, I think when I've talked about it before on my channel, I talk, I say it's an epistolary novel, but in fact, flipping through it now, it's a... Uh, it's in the form of diary entries. I don't think we call that epistolary, do we? And it was published in 1941. Opening two paragraphs. And this is uh, dated Saturday evening, April 8th. And I believe this was set. I don't know if it was in the 1930s or 1940s. Oh, and this is about uh, the point of view. The diarist is the minister's wife in this rinky-dink little town. And Philip is her husband. I don't know if we ever learn her name, and it's about adultery in the manse. Philip has thrown himself across the bed and fallen asleep, his clothes on still, one of his long legs dangling to the floor. It's been a hard day on him, putting up stovepipes and opening crates, for the fourth time getting our old linoleum down. He hasn't the hands for it. I could use the pliers and hammer twice as well myself with none of his mutterings or smashed-up fingers either. But in the parsonage, on calling days, it simply isn't done. In return for their thousand dollars a year, they expect a genteel kind of piety, a well-bred Christianity that will serve as an example to the little sons and daughters of the town. It was twelve years ago, in our first town, that I learned my lesson, one day when they caught me in the woodshed making kindling of a packing box. Surely this isn't necessary, Mrs. Bentley. Your position in the community, and Mr. Bentley such a big, able-bodied man. Yeah, this is just wonderful. At some point, after I reread it for a third time, I may do a read-along on my channel, but uh, I can't wait to reread it myself. At that same used bookstore, 8th Street Books in Saskatoon, I found three books by Matt Cohen. And Matt Cohen... I read one of his novels, I think it was called Nadine, in the 1990s. And last year I read one of his best-known novels, which has the best title in all of Canadian literature, The Sweet Second Summer of Kitty Malone. And it just made me fall in love with his writing. He died young of cancer, like he was about 60, 15 or 20 years ago. So I found three books by him. This one might be his debut, The Disinherited. It's got one of those stupid descriptions where it doesn't tell you a thing about the book. And this is one of my pet peeves about back cover blurbs. Even though I don't really want to know very much, but what does this mean? Moving through vast dimensions of seasons and cosmic cycles, Still on airing in its depiction of details and of the events of everyday life. The Disinherited is a richly textured tapestry of dreams, ancestral memories, and haunting symbols. A work of major literary proportion. That is just utter crap. Who, like... Just stop! Anyway, so I, I, it's an early book of his. The first paragraph didn't necessarily do anything for me, but I don't care because he grew into a writer whose uh, work I greatly admire. So, also a collection of his stories called Getting Lucky, published uh, near the end of his life. He died in 1999, so this was actually published posthumously. And here is the opening few lines of the title story, L Getting Lucky. It just makes me laugh. Michael, the woman said. That's quite a name. She leaned across the table and squinted at his face as though it were a book with small print. Michael. Now there's a name that says something to me. Okay. And I think this one, I didn't uh, do all the research I could have because this is already going to be a long enough video, but this was his final novel, Elizabeth and After, and I think it won the Governor General's Award. Pretty sure. And it also has a ridiculous blurb. A highly acclaimed story of ambition, sex, memory, and marriage. 
Uh, it's about uh, set in small town Ontario. Rich in insights about human foibles and aspirations. And an unforgettable portrait of a place and the people who live there. It's just garbage. Like, don't, if, you're, if you're not going to say anything, don't say anything. Like, that just drives me crazy. And I don't know why it bothers me as much as it does, because I don't usually read the back. But when I do, like, just to give you a little bit of what it's about. Oh, it's a portrait of a place and the people who live there. Oh, my God. I assume it's a wonderful novel. He's a wonderful writer. And listen to this. This opening paragraph makes me so glad that I quit smoking about four years ago and uh, so uh, regretful that I didn't quit ten years ago. As William McKelvey lay twisted in his bed, grizzled barrel chest barely moving, each drawn-in breath rattled like a truck full of gravel being poured through a giant tin culvert. There followed a brief moment during which the echo grew as hollow as a horror movie tomb. Then the gushing exhalation began, a long, moist flushing out of spongy lungs, clogged by decades of tobacco and wood smoke. Ugh. I can't wait. I want to read everything Matt Cohen ever wrote uh, and uh, try to, in my own small way, contribute to spreading the news about this wonderful writer. The, the last one of the used bookstore halls is a Barbara Commons novel, The Vet's Daughter. And I was aware of her, but just the, her name, until I read The Book of Forgotten Authors. And there's a short chapter, a short essay about Barbara Commons in there. And this is apparently her best-known novel. I hadn't remembered this was her best-known novel when I picked it up at the used bookstore, but in fact, it is. And I skimmed that chapter again just before this. He said... It's about a veterinarian who, ab who abuses animals, abuses his wife and his daughter. The protagonist is his daughter, his adult daughter. And he's also a vivisectionist, which I had to Google because I never really completely understood what a vivisectionist was. So you might want to Google it yourself. It doesn't sound like a happy story. Originally published in 1959. A man with small eyes and a ginger mustache came and spoke to me when I was thinking of something else. Together we walked down a street that was lined with privet hedges. He told me his wife belonged to the Plymouth Brethren, and I said I was sorry, because that is what he seemed to need me to say, and I saw he was a poor, broken-down sort of creature. If he had been a horse, he would have most likely worn kneecaps. We came to a great red railway arch that crossed the road like a heavy rainbow. And near this arch there was a vet's house, with a lamp outside. I said, you must excuse me, and left this poor man among the privet hedges. That is just a gorgeous opening paragraph. That same day, we went to McNally Robinson, which is in New Books. And I got quite a stack there, and then went back a day or so later and got some more. Another Elizabeth Taylor novel, A View of the Harbor. And this is the uh, Vir Virago Modern Classics. Aren't they gorgeous? This is one of her most famous ones, set in the faded coastal village of Newby. Originally published in 1947. The only one I've read so far was one of her last novels, and it was just uh, called Mrs. Palfrey at the Claremont. And I want to read everything now. There is a Goodreads group. I think Ange has joined it that are reading her, her entire oeuvre in sequence and I just can't take that on when I'm still working delightedly on Barbara Pym's complete oeuvre in sequence and now Muriel Sparks so I'm not gonna do that with them but uh, when they get to this I'd like to jump in with this. No gulls escorted the trawlers going out of the harbor at tea time as they would on the return journey. They sat upon the rocking waters without excitement, perching along the sides of little boats, slapped up and down by one wake after another. When they rose and stretched their wings, they were brilliantly white against the green sea, as white as the lighthouse. I love Elizabeth Taylor. Based on one novel, I'm just totally crazy for her. This is the newest release, maybe the only new release that I bought. And I think I might have heard a little bit, maybe on Twitter, I don't think anybody on BookTube that I follow has 
talked about this, so let me debut it. Immigrant Montana, a novel by Amitabha Kumar. And it's an interesting title, so it's Immigrant Lover Montana Bihar, a novel, a meditation, but Lover Bihar and a meditation is crossed out. So in fact the title is Immigrant Montana. And it's really attractive. Hardcover. And based on the page 112 test, I uh, I bought this. So it's about uh, an immigrant to America from India. He arrives in post-Reagan America. One of the epigraphs is from Boris Pilniak. The revolution smells of sexual organs. Oh my. Full page opening paragraph. I was a new immigrant, eager to shine. And if self-abuse were to be omitted from the reckoning, pure of body and heart. The letters I sent my parents in India were full of enthusiasm for the marvels of my new life. To those who welcomed me to America, I wanted to say, without even being asked, that E.T. ought to have won the Oscar over Gandhi. I had found the latter insufficiently authentic, but more crucially, I felt insufficiently authentic myself. Not so much fake as insubstantial. I understood that I needed a suitable narrative to present to the people I was meeting. There was only contempt in my heart for my fellow Indian students who repeated stories about trying to educate ignorant Americans in barber shops who had asked how come they spoke such good English, or if they belonged to tribes, or grew up among tigers. The nostalgia I had come to treasure was a hypertrophied sense of the past as a place, a place with street signs and a figure atop a staircase that I recognized. This desire had nothing to do with the kinds of claims to civilizational superiority that make men demolish places of worship or want to bomb cities into oblivion. I knew this, and yet I was uncertain about my story. I lacked calm self-knowledge. If a woman spoke to me, particularly if she was attractive, I grew excited and talked too much. Sounds really wonderful. I hope to get to this soon. I just gotta stop doing readathons, or find a readathon it'll fit into, or get somebody to buddy read it with me. Similarly, and I could have sworn that uh, Eric Carl Anderson talked about this, but I, when I Google, when I do a text search on YouTube, nobody on BookTube has talked about it. This is a new release from Angola, Transparent City by Onjaki, and this is a beautiful physical book soft cover heavy paper it just really feels gorgeous in your hands which is uh, always a I'm a sucker for that Anjaki was born in Luanda Angola in 1977 he's written five novels four short story collections and many books of poetry and children's books he now lives in Rio de Janeiro and it's his pen name Anjaki is his pen name so this is an experimental novel, and it's got a lot of magical realism in it, and those are not usually my cup of tea, but I the page 112 was really strong. So it's uh, set in a crumbling apartment block in Luanda, and it's about all the peoples, all the people there. And in the middle of it all is the main character, nostalgic for the country of his youth and searching for his lost son. This book is short on capital letters and punctuation, and uh, I still am quite beguiled. Here are the first few short paragraphs. You still haven't told me what color the fire is. Blind man spoke towards the kid's hand, which was gripping his arm, the two of them terrified of standing still in case the tongues of flame bursting out of the floor in search of the Loanda sky engulfed them. If I knew how to explain the color of the fire, Elder, I'd be one of them poets that goes around babbling poems. In a hypnotized voice, Seashell Seller moved where the heat pushed him and led blind man down more or less safe paths where the water gushing out of the burst pipes opened passageways for anybody who dared to move in the wind-lashed jungle of the blaze. Please, you with your good vision, go see. I feel it on my skin, but I still want to imagine the fire's color. 
and I forgot to say that this was translated from the Portuguese by Stephen Hennigan. I am really excited for this. Next is Wild Geese by Martha Ostenso. This is a Canadian literary classic. I read it in that same Western Canadian lit class. It was originally published in 1925. And Canada... Uh, we have only a partial claim on Martha Ostenso. She did. She was born in Norway in 1900 and came with her family to Manitoba. But at the age of 21, she's moved to Columbia and stayed in New York. And then for the rest of her life, lived in Minnesota. Minnesota. So most of her uh, North American life was in America, but this was set in Manitoba and uh, so we're going to claim her at least that much. Have any of you Americans ever heard of her? I haven't heard of any of her other books, but she wrote several others. So this is set uh, in northern Manitoba on the windswept plain, and its protagonist, Judith, is struggling to get out from under the thumb of her brutal, controlling father. I read this novel in the early 90s, loved it, don't remember a damn thing about it. And so her father is Caleb Gare, so that's who is being referred to in this opening paragraph. It was not openly spoken of, but the family was waiting for Caleb Gare. Even Lind Archer, the new school teacher, who had come late that afternoon all the way from Yellow Post with the Indian mail carrier and must therefore be hungry, was waiting. Amelia Gare, Caleb's wife, with all her cheerful bustling about the kitchen as if everything weren't quite ready, could not break the suspense. Judith and Charlie had milked several of the cows and had come in and out of the house repeatedly for no reason whatever. Martin, slow and clumsy of feeling as he was, had cleaned the entire stable so thoroughly that it looked unnatural. Ellen, Martin's twin, was playing the organ but appeared to have forgotten even the more familiar parts of her repertoire, such as Red Wing and the less recent Ben Bolt. Ellen played, harmoniously enough, by ear. Yeah, I remember how great the writing was, so I can't wait to reread this one. I'm pretty sure it was on Eric Carlin, but I didn't double check. But in my memory, it was on Eric's channel, but it, I think several people are talking about this. This Mournable Body by Cece Dangaremba. And it's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous soft cover. It's uh, newly out uh, printed by Grey Wolf Press that everybody on BookTube loves. And I flipped through it and I loved the writing. So I bought it even though it's in second person. So it's all you, you, you. And that's a pet peeve of mine. But I'm going to give my damnedest to... to uh, to read it anyway because I really do did love the writing I think I read page 112 and flipped through it and it's really strong writing so this is uh, Dengaremba is a Zimbabwean novelist and she, uh, her earlier novel one of her earlier novels was quite well known Nervous Conditions I've never read her the only Zimbabwean writer I've read is No Violet Bulawayo and her novel we Need New Names is uh, my favorite African novel. I can't wait to read this. And this is set in modern day Zimbabwe. It's about a young woman trying to make a success under such dire conditions. There is a fish in the mirror. The mirror is above the wash basin in the corner of your hostel room. The tap, cold only in the rooms, is dripping. Still in bed, you roll onto your back and stare at the ceiling. Realizing your arm has gone to sleep, you move it back and forth with your working hand until pain bursts through in a blitz of pins and needles. It is the day of the interview. You should be up. You lift your head and fall back onto the pillow. Finally, though, you are at the sink. There, the fish stares back at you out of purplish eye sockets, its mouth gaping, cheeks drooping as though under the weight of monstrous scales. You cannot look at yourself. The dripping tap annoys you, so you tighten it before you turn it on again. A perverse action. Your gut heaves with dull satisfaction. Can't wait to try this. Brita, I think this might be a Brita book. What do you think? 
the last two I have talked about, so I'll do them very uh, briefly here. Uh, they are on my uh, Women in Translation readathon. Hurta Muller's The Fox Was Ever the Hunter. And I'll just read you the opening paragraph. It's, a, it's about a young school teacher in the dying days of the Ceausescu regime in Romania. Opening two paragraphs are quite intriguing. The ant is carrying a dead fly three times its size. The ant can't see the way ahead. It flips the fly around and crawls back. Adina doesn't want to block the ant's path, so she pulls in her elbow. A clump of tar next to her knee glistens as it seethes in the sun. Adina dabs at the tar with her finger, raising a thin thread that stiffens in the air before it snaps. The ant has the head of a pin. The sun can't find any place to burn. The sun stings. The ant loses its way. It crawls, but is not alive. The human eye does not consider it an animal. The spike heads of the grasses on the outskirts of town crawl the same way. The fly is alive because it's three times the size of the ant, and because it's being carried, the human eye does consider the fly an animal. Interesting. And I won't read from this because uh, the prose in the first page didn't strike me as being all that great, but this is the memoir, The Unceasing Storm by Catherine Luau, and it has about 17 translators, so check the show notes for them. But it is about uh, a woman uh, growing up in China through the Cultural Revolution, with a foreword by Madeleine Tien, and uh, I hope the, it's a good read, but the first page of the first ch chapter was not uh, something that I needed to share with you. So, that is my massive book haul. Which of these have you, uh, which of these strike you as interesting? Have you read any of these books? What are your thoughts? I look forward to your comments below. Thanks for watching!